ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Canadian Bowler Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Lucas Caldwell, and I'm here again today with special host, Michael Patuli. Mike, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. How are you doing today, Luke? Oh, you know, not too bad. Trying to survive the Ontario humidity and all that fun stuff. Yeah, I don't miss, don't miss being in Ontario in late June, early July. Definitely yeah. not the most optimal no, weather when it gets to 30 time. degrees. Yeah. Well, we have Michael here again today because Daryl's still taking his uh, parental leave from the podcast, if you will. Uh, Daryl is producing the show today, so he's around to run the chat and make sure everything runs as smooth as possible. We appreciate that, Daryl. And uh, before we get started, guys, just remember to like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. It's all all of our information is down below in the information uh, section there. Um, pretty much it. Make sure you hit that notification bell and share it with all your friends. We do appreciate it. We're well on our way to our goal of a thousand subscribers. We're at six fifty seven, slowly increasing, slow and steady, but it's going great. Mikey, let's talk Australian Open. Yes, Australian Open just uh, wrapped up over the week there. It was a pretty exciting event. There was quite a few uh, good games, good results. It looked like it was pretty competitive along with even the little bit of the restrictions and everything that they had to do with the redraws that we kind of touched on the last time. Um, at least we can get into some highlights or uh, I guess sort of touch on the results that happened. So... I guess with the the um, results that we had, the men's singles winner uh, was Aaron Wilson. So Disco won the final there, uh, twenty-one to fourteen. So it was a pretty good match. I watched that one uh, portion of it live. I didn't see the actual ending of it, but I did see that Aaron beat Wayne Turley twenty-one to fourteen. So that was a Pretty good match. Pretty classic Aaron Wilson performance from what I've seen. Yes, very much so. He's top-notch player. That's why he's been on Team Australia for quite a few years now. Uh, and then I guess if we're jumping into the men's pairs, uh, men's pairs, we had uh, Cody Packer and Matt Johnstone defeat Gary Pearson and Cohen Litvin. Uh, that final was 21-20. I watched this one live. It was actually like an incredible game right to the finish. Uh, like 2019 coming home, and they scored the two to win. It was quite a game, actually, to like to see the last. It literally came, comes down to the last shot, essentially. The where we're seeing it right here. He draws in for yeah, the two. the first time I've actually seen that, so that's pretty exciting. Yeah, so it was, it was it was a great game. Like I watched the last three or four ends. It was terrific. Bowls back and forth. I think they each held the win on the final end there. So as you see the people celebrating, it was a tremendous end of that game. Uh, and then the men's fours, uh, we had Ben Twist, Dave Ferguson, Aaron Houston, and Ray Pierce defeat Jamie Anderson, Brad Lawson, John Green, and Scott DeYoung. That was about the only sort of lopsided final for the men's section there. It was 18-3, to three. so that one ended pretty quick. Uh, it was very one-sided game. I, I just saw the highlights of it, and it looked like there was a couple big conversion shots by Ray Pierce there, but still some high-end bowls and obviously uh, a good tournament to, to win for any of those men, and Pierce and Twist both common jackaroos, so good results for them. Uh, for jump into the women's section, so for women's singles, the winner was uh, Natasha Van Eldick, defeated Jamie Lee Wersnip. Uh, the final of that one was twenty-one to twelve. So yes, we're getting it looks like the last end there. So not the closest of games that you can have for singles, but I watched a portion of that one as well, and it was. Natasha was just really on that game, so it was actually quite a good result for her because I think she's won a few Australian Open singles titles now, so another good result for her. Uh, women's pairs, we had 
Kelsey Cottrell and Lindsay Clark defeating Christina Christick and Ellen Ryan. Uh, that one was, again, not the closest game, 17 to 10, but it was, as you see there, big conversion shots. So if you get any big conversion shots, it makes a difference. And then in the, the women's fours, we also had uh, Kelsey Cottrell uh, winning the, the ladies' fours along with her teammates of Sam Ferguson, uh, Lindsay Clark, and Ann Johns. So again, she was uh, announced the MVP of the Australian Open, so she had a really good week there because I think she lost in the semifinals of the singles too, so quite a week for her. Yeah, it's pretty uh, impressive stuff. Uh, I got to ask you, Mike, though, what was your uh, biggest highlight from the Australian Open this past uh, week? Personally, my favorite part was that we had a bull streaker. So uh, if anyone uh, saw it live, it's Daryl's got a, a good photo there for us. Uh, it's not the first time we've had a streaker in lawn bowling. I think it's believe it about, or not. Yeah, it's about the third one that I know of. Um, so this one was kind of funny to get live because it's a pretty good image. If you look at the people in the background, we got here a couple of them are pretty shocked. Some of them are pretty interested. And then we got some good laughs. So a little bit of an interesting thing to see on a lawn bowling green. Can't say I've personally seen it, but I know, uh, I've show, I showed you the one that I knew of. It was from 2001. I think it was the World Indoor. And uh, David Grillet uh, gets a hug from a, a nice streaking lady. So not the first time with Plum Bowling. I don't imagine it'll be the last time, but definitely something different than you typically see with a normal lawn bowling match it's definitely not something i expected to see you really only uh, see stuff like that when it comes to uh like big sporting events like nba championships and soccer stuff and whatever else with tons of people and millions of eyes on the tv so it's definitely interesting to see something like that in the sport of bowls yeah it's not something i think that we're going to commonly see going forward but i, I it was one of my sort of highlights of the tournament because it, it made some made some news and definitely is a little bit weird to see a guy running across the green completely naked but always interesting yeah that's for sure uh, i guess we can move forward from the australian open i mean if john Simon's in the chat what was it like not attending your second australian open in a row since you usually go down it's probably a little disappointing for you um <laughs> But, uh, yeah, let's talk about uh, – we've talked about this a lot in the past, but let's talk about uh, some reopening stuff and rules that are going on that are quite interesting, uh, in my opinion. Uh, I'll let you start, Mike. What's it been like out there? I know there's been uh, some big stuff going on out in the Regina Bulls Club. Yeah, like Saskatchewan's really opened up the last couple of weeks. Uh, July 11th, actually, we are literally having all of our mask mandates and restrictions go away. So Saskatchewan's completely open again. As of July the 11th, um, they're allowing bowling everything right now just with minimal masking and sort of minimal restrictions at this point. So uh, we had our club does a B-cubed, which is essentially a bowls, beverages, and barbecue event on Thursday nights to try and bring in sort of the more casual or the younger crowd. So they were able to start that two weeks ago. They've been have it going. They have a full green, so what's that? Eight rinks, two te two teams, so sixteen teams. It looks like right now. That's so, pretty exciting. Yeah, pretty good turnout. Looks like it's going really well uh, in that aspect. And then I know Saskatchewan's, along with Alberta, we're both moving forward with covid provincials or whatever you want to call them so a little bit on the restricted side and they're not the, the full gambit of provincials that we typically have but they're still doing something so there's uh, men's pairs uh singles mixed pairs so it's kind of about half of what there usually was but it's still kind of an uh a decent plethora of events that we're going to be able to play and sort of get going this year which will be nice yeah, uh, what's it like what's it like out there in ontario uh, I know here I can't really speak on too, too much because uh, I'm not overly involved in a lot of different clubs, but I've seen some places like in Woodstock and up around those areas where they have pretty decent turnouts for their open practice sessions and their leagues or whatever they have going on. Uh, I know my dad signed up there this year and he gets he's going down a couple nights a week and playing in the pairs that they have, um, just kind of bowling. And I've heard that's going pretty well. Um Again, I can't speak on too, too much uh, stuff just because 
again, I'm only tied to one club, but I know here at my home club, it's been a little interesting uh, for me personally. And I was kind of looking to get your opinion on it, Mike, and maybe somebody in the chat. Um, I don't know what the restrictions put out by the Ontario Lombos Association or how it we really work along with the Ontario guidelines. But I know my biggest issue was the time slots that are allotted for people to bowl or during the week in the middle of the days or at five o'clock in the afternoon when someone like myself, a working class individual who works out of the general area of the lawn bowling club can't get down to the green. Um, so I, it, for me, it's quite frustrating and I don't understand why I can't show up and roll a bowl on a green by myself with zero equipment and nobody around, but they're allowing me to go practice with other people on mm -hmm. certain times. I just don't understand the logic behind it personally. So I was just curious on your opinion on that, Mike. Yeah, I, I can understand why you'd be frustrated with that because especially I'm the same thing as you where I work until 4 o'clock each day and if it was the same thing where they had draws in the afternoon, I wouldn't be able to play or practice at all either. So I understand your frustration there and I get where if you're going by yourself, you're you're going to definitely limit the spread because there's no spread to be having and sort of the, the safety side of things. It's pretty safe to have a person by out on the greens by themselves. And if you clean up after yourself, everything like that, it, it's really no skin off your club's back. But I, I do understand their side of it too, where it's not completely clear province to province right now, what is allowed, what isn't allowed. Like last night I went and looked at all the different club associations uh, across Canada and, it doesn't even seem that it's clear in a lot of the provinces what's allowed, what's not allowed. And I know Ontario's kind of been back and forth and you guys just moved to a phase two or something. I, I don't know what your guys' terms are, but some sort of a recent change where it looks like pairs was starting to be allowed or something along those lines. So it's constantly changing, but I know I think down the line, once vaccinations, everything keep improving and, maybe the case loads go down, you guys probably will get back to a, a little more normal and someone like you might be able to bowl whenever you want. Yeah, I'm just, the part, again, that I'm struggling with is I just don't understand, like, uh, I spoke to, to Daryl about it last night. He kind of broke it down for me, but he didn't have a whole lot of input on it either. But if somebody out there has information, I'd be more than happy to listen because I'm curious myself on just how the rules are made up because to me, it doesn't make much sense on like where do the time slots that they cho choose come from? Does somebody have to be there, a staff member, to supervise what you're doing? I, I, I personally just don't get it because like golf courses are open for 12 hours a day and you can show up whenever you want and play around to golf with other people. So that's the that's just the part that I have a hard time wrapping my head around. It's like I was saying to you last night, I can drive past the lawn bowling club and can't go in to the green that's on a two acre property with nobody around and roll a bowl on the green with no equipment if I choose not to have it. But I can watch people play baseball and tennis across the road with no restrictions. So that's just the part that I struggle with. Um, but I mean, again, I don't want to break the rules. I'm completely content following the rules. I'm just curious on on how that works. Yeah, I, I would understand your <laughs> frustrations there too. I think it just comes down to the, the getting the, uh, the governments and everything in line because we might not be a priority sport in a lot of governments there. Yeah, for looks sure. Like, looks like we got a comment from our friend Cam the Man, the Rock Lobster. Uh, he's saying Nova Scotia is reopening, and we're currently looking at having tournaments. Yeah, like when I was reading their website, Nova Scotia's website last night. It, appears they're having provincials just like saskatchewan and alberta are so i i'm not an expert for that region but if according to their website it looks like they're having essentially the full docket of tournaments and provincials which is great to see it's obviously awesome to be able to play and kind of get back to a normal so it's good to hear that nova scotia is at least running something semi-normal too I know here in Ontario, they've uh, some clubs have canceled all their stuff for the year, but other ones are still planning on hosting things in late August. That was loud. I'm sorry. Uh, in late August or uh, whatever, so that's pretty exciting. I mean, that's basically part of the reason why I want to sign up to a club this year. So if that potentially happens, I can get out there. Cool. Yeah, like uh, the one thing I saw the other day, like a bit of a 180 from where you were going there. The Alberta looks like I guess in Ontario you guys have had an Ontario Premier League for a few yep. years and it looks like Alberta is doing their own version or trying to start their own version of the Ontario Premier League so do you know if that's running or if there's any sort of plans to bring that back this year uh, I'm honestly not entirely you mean the uh, the OPL 
Yeah. Um, that'd be a question that Daryl would be able to answer better, but I'm going to assume no. Um, I know a lot of those guys are that are involved in that are also involved in the WOBA committee, and WOBA was canceled, so I'd have to imagine if they're going to cancel one, the other one's going to get canceled. Uh, but, yeah, I'm not entirely sure. As far as I know, no, it's not running, but, I again, I'm not entirely sure on that one. Okay. Yeah, no, I just saw the... Uh... The posting by Bulls Alberta, and it looks like an interesting idea with their running just the kind of it looks like they're splitting Calgary, Edmonton into different areas and going to have sort of each club make their own team of five and then sort of do playoffs between the clubs. Uh, I think it's a brilliant idea, honestly. It could be something I think most provinces and sort of cities could sort of emulate. Like, uh, you make a sort of an all star team or an all star team or two, depending on the membership you have at a club, and it's a good way to sort of get i guess a club camaraderie going because you you'll get people playing together that don't typically play together and if you're playing against the best players from other clubs it's good competition for the elite bowlers so um, question that i question that i'd have for that is uh you saying kind of like an all-star team and you said it's five versus five are they gonna have like an a b c and d like what if like 50 people show up are they just gonna cut 45 people that want to play just because they're not good enough or like how do you think that would work that's the one thing I, I when I looked at the poster that they had about this league starting, it doesn't really clearly say, and it kind of says that they'd have like a selector or a coach per se, and that I, I think it could get a little interesting if you have to pick five people from maybe a higher end club because you're yeah. gonna have probably some pretty good bowlers to pick from. So it would be interesting to kind of get the full format outlined from there because yes, as you're saying, who how do you pick? It could be interesting. I'd just be worried with that style of thing. It would come down to uh, pretty political stuff and people being upset. Uh, like you and I both know with uh, other selection processes and criteria, it kind of gets a little interesting from time to time. Uh, so I think uh, the best I think the best way to do it, which may or may not be possible depending on interest from as you said it's just with two clubs. Well, uh, it looks like it's quite a few clubs across the province. So it looks like they're kind of splitting it. Like Edmonton has three or four different clubs, and then each of them would put a team in. And Calgary has even more than that. And it looks like wow, each okay. of them would put a team in. So again, it's hard. I, I it looked like it was kind of just a beginning document. They just put it out on Wednesday or Thursday last week. So maybe we yeah. can get some more info and touch on it later. If Derek Dillon's in the chat today, I'd be curious to see what I'm sure he's involved in it. So I'd be curious to see uh, what he thinks about it. Um, but yeah, I think the best way to run something like that would be almost like the Australian format where they have an A side, a B side and so on and so forth. Just based on the interest, I realize the numbers are a little different there. But again, I think it would be kind of uh, demoralizing for a member of a club to be cut from a, a team to try and just to try and play. So uh, I, I'm not sure how that would run, but. It's a good idea, and, um, nonetheless. And, like, honestly, you're promoting kind of the grassroots side of things, too, if you do have, as you're saying, a B side or C side, because you might get a guy who's bold for two or three years and wants to be competitive, but they're maybe not at the level of a national team person. So maybe having that option to be the B side player would be helpful to sort of bring a lot of people along. And I think that's something we can't really understate for a tournament or format like this is that it would actually help a lot of sort of those up and coming people develop and play against the better players and get experience. I think it'd be fun if they, if they were going to do just a straight up five, I think it'd be fun if they had a little inner club play down sort of qualification thing where your top five players uh, go through and get to be part of your team. I think that'd be sort of interesting. Again, I don't know how that would work, but who knows? Mm -hmm. I'm sure I'm sure they have an idea of what they want to do. So I don't want to be too, too harsh on them. But yeah, like I said, great idea. Yeah, no, that's definitely something that's going to be fun to see how they the, develop it. I, I look forward to see if they have kind of the, the cool names like Ontario has with the OPL. Like if they start the, I don't know, the Calgary Lawn Bulls, Kraken, whatever the heck you want to call the team. I, I It would be kind of cool to always see the names. I always find it fun to see what sort of in interesting names you get from different yeah different clubs. ideas whatever yeah. yeah for sure we got i guess for the b cubed league that we have in regina there that's probably my favorite thing each year is to see the different team names that they get each season so like guacaboli and the jackhawks so like teams just 
kind of taking names that they have from different sports teams or kind of funny puns. It's always interesting to see what people come up with. It's pretty awesome to see stuff like that popping up all over the all over the country and get more people involved, especially with uh, how little interprovincial stuff there is going on at this time. So it's nice to see that where it's available, things are happening. Yeah, no, it, it's good that we're starting to get reopened, starting to sort of have some bulls to talk about again, because with the different provincials and everything, that'll give us some results to sort of relay from the different provinces as it comes along here, and then hopefully a, a back to normal maybe come next season where maybe we have a nationals and everything like that again. Yeah. I'm curious to see what's going to happen next year, but it should be fun. Uh, I guess uh, if you guys are curious on what you can be doing to get ready for the uh, nationals next year, we did have a, a video get posted out there on uh, some, some coaching aspects, a Daryl show called technical difficulties. Uh, if anybody in the chat has watched that yet, and I'm curious on you know, what your opinion on that show was and how Daryl did. Um, if you have watched it, what were some good takeaways for yourself that you got from that show and uh, should Daryl keep going? What did you think about that, Mike? I thought Daryl did a great job. Um, it's a idea we've been kicking around for a while, so I'm kind of throwing some more technical and coaching videos out there because Daryl and me both kind of come from a more coaching background than you do. Uh, we both are certified coaches at different levels, and we both have worked with lots of people coaching-wise, and it was good that we actually got our first video there, and I thought Daryl did a great job editing it together because he does sort of give you a good framework to start out a season with, and I think it's something that a lot of people could implement, and it really does help doing an assessment because if you're honest with yourself and you do see the numbers where, oh, I'm not a very good draw bowler on my forehand, then it gives you things that you can work on and allows you to target a lot of things in your game because if you do have weaknesses and if you can develop them, make them better you're gonna obviously be a stronger player i think one of the biggest uh things to take away from me personally from the video is just um being honest with yourself because it's so easy to lie and inflate numbers and think that you're doing better than you are and i don't know i'm sure you and i have both done it mike when you're out there doing a drill and you're only missing your spot by this much and you can just give it to yourself anyways where in reality it's almost better to be harsh just so you have something to work on because even if you're doing that good you could, there's always room for improvement no matter what yeah like the being honest part uh, daryl stresses it in the video and something that i know from back when i was on the national team and practicing i constantly was harsh on myself where oh it's mat length and i'm an inch outside of mat length it's doesn't count so it's just one of those things where you really should be honest with yourself when you're doing an assessment and sort of starting your year out because there's no need to say oh yeah it's good enough well if it wasn't or it's close you you may want to work on that 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 item and sort of develop it or bring it along a bit because any sort of additional practice and targeted practice is always helpful with bulls i think another good thing just to remember about that stuff too with the honesty and practice is just remember that it's okay to have a bad day everybody has bad days like i've gone out there and shanked 400 bulls in a row and had a really crappy percentage as you can't always be perfect but that's why you're out there practicing to try and limit those days and have better bad days than what you could be having so just uh just uh be persistent and honest with yourself and keep on keeping on and things will get better yeah daryl just posted in the chat inches make the difference between being shot and not so exactly with lawn bowling practicing it, it's really a game of inches and being hard on yourself is better than showing up to a match and constantly not being shot because you said oh my my good enough should be good enough in a game when it's obviously sometimes not so yeah exactly with with the video we put out there like if anyone has suggestions for technical difficulties uh, any sort of specific video you'd want to see a certain topic you want daryl to cover um i potentially might even jump in with some stuff on technical difficulties it's hard to say but if you have any sort of topics anything you want us to cover definitely let us know because we're open to suggestions we're open to kind of tailoring videos to what people want to see uh, we started out with that one because it's a good way to sort of get the season going and there's a couple other ones we kind of have planned coming down the pipe here so they're they're gonna come sometime here in the, the summer i believe but 
if we have any sort of targeted videos that people want to see, we, we definitely will take suggestions into account and maybe make some videos under request if, if there's enough demand there. And suggestions are a big deal for us because uh, our most requested videos have been coaching and uh, sort of like uh, analyzing stuff. So we want to know what you guys want to see so we can uh, cater to cater to you. If uh, yeah, Again, like what Mike said, just let us know. Don't be afraid to uh, let us know what you want to hear. Yeah, we're, see, we're, sorry. Yeah, we're, we're always open to pretty much creating any type of content that people want to see just with Daryl's background as a high-ranking coach there and me kind of as the lower level club level one we we do have some expertise and we've coached a fair bit so it's something we probably can lend quite a bit of information and knowledge to about pretty much any topic when it comes to bowls and practicing so definitely expect some new stuff along the lines and we hope you enjoy sort of the the coaching side of the channel here that we're going to try and develop over the next little while Absolutely. And just before we move on, I did want to mention that if you missed the first half of the show, we will be available on YouTube uh, just right after the show is completed and will be available on all major podcast platforms for your listening pleasure. If you like to listen to it on the way to work while you're maybe out on the green practicing, you want something to listen to, we're available out there for download and for your listening pleasures. Uh, so don't forget about that. Um, I guess moving forward, Mike, I got a question for you. I don't know mm -hmm. if we've talked about this in the past or not, but just... Uh, what do you think is uh, more beneficial for the uh, bowler out there? You see, I'm sure you've seen all sorts of stuff where people are using big wide turning bowls and narrow turning bowls. What do you think is the, uh, in your opinion, what is the best option for the all, the end all be all bowl? For me, I, I've always used a bowl that has a little more bend to it. Um, I used a Drake's Pride Professional and they're not the biggest turning bowl, but they, they do have a good hard finish on them. I've moved to wider bowls as I've played more. So for me personally, I like a bowl that turns because there's not a lot of skill sometimes when you throw a bowl that barely moves or essentially holds straight down the line the whole way. But with Canadian green, sometimes you might not be able to even make your bowl bend anyways. So I personally like to use one with a little bit more of a bend because the bend helps you really make more skillful shots and allows you to be able to be more skillful with your play so that's where i would always lean towards what's your idea of your ideal bowl uh, it's pretty tough for me honestly because like has like we've talked i think we've touched on this before it's a pretty controversial topic um like you said being you can obviously make the more skillful shot with the big sexy vendors obviously uh that's been my that's been my uh style of bowl i've always run a pretty wide turning bowl uh, i just like them better personally I think it's easier to make things happen and you can always come around something on the outside if you have to. Um, but on the other hand of the argument playing devil's advocate, if you can throw a straight bowl down the middle and pin the jack every time and win a game, then I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If you're, if you could, let's just say where we put it into people compare lawn bowling to golf for whatever reason, if you have a certain golf club that strikes the ball different and it's going to make your game easier, why would you not use it? Yeah. No, I, I agree with you there. Like some people can make the straight bowl work and a bowl that barely moves. They're outrageously effective. Like I remember when I played in China uh, a couple of years back, one of the teams we played against on an eight second green, they were all using essentially bowls that don't move or straight bowls, even for a fast green and their skip somehow was able to be effective with it. He played a lot more raised shots than you typically see things like that, where He's played the shots that he had available to him, but you could tell he's practiced, used the bowl. So I guess a lot of it comes down to your ability to use your bowl is, I guess, the main thing. So if you do like the bender, play with it, get used to it. But if you want to use the straight bowls, uh, you're, you're probably going to incur the wrath of some people because I know there's a lot of people out there that have a lot more uh, opinionated ideas on the this topic than me and you do where you talk about using a straight bowl with some people they'll they'll give you more than an earful about it absolutely and like i said i can can understand why but like i like i just don't see what's wrong with using something that works and like daryl said in the chat it's legal so why wouldn't you use it if you can use a hockey stick that's going to shoot the puck a little harder and a little straighter are you going to use it probably so i don't know i just yeah, I think you have to put it into perspective i definitely think there's a time and a place for straight bowls and i think there's a time and a place for for big wide benders like i mean if you're a lead on a team of uh, on a force team i don't think there's anything wrong with putting bowls down the middle so if we're going to be the devil's advocate you're talking about that earlier 
when when would we potentially start restricting bowls so do you think someone shows up to your next game and they have some like a bowling ball but somehow it's approved by world bowls what do you think about something like that where do you kind of draw the line for how straight of a bowl is too straight um i don't know that's a tough one like uh, like there's some bowls out there that are pretty damn straight on a slow green like if you go get an sr taylor srv or whatever those things are called or the dreamline x what i don't even know what they're called man i've never really used them so but some of the dreamlines that are out there xgs is that what they're called yeah uh this really straight ones they're pretty pretty darn straight like bowling ball straight here so i don't know if you can limit them it's like you said if you can be more skillful and have more options with a bendy bowl why would you argue the point on that you shouldn't be using a straight bowl yep no and i've honestly i've played against people too that use the really old bowls like that uh, had inserts like we're talking very very old bowls with the inserts that turn literally sideways so yeah i i think you pretty much have to allow anything there's not really a point where we're gonna probably start restricting but i guess it's all about your skill level and how much you understand how your bowl moves because the the crazy sideways ones are definitely a different type of bowl to play against yeah and like i said I, uh, there's a time and a place in restricting bowls i don't think it really works or really matters because if me and you were on a forest team and the other teams all their skip is using the straightest bowl known to man and there's 15 bowls in the middle of the green they're probably not going to be very effective so uh, again i don't think it really matters i mean in singles i guess the argument could be there but I yeah don't, i don't know i don't know it's a tough one <laughs> It's honestly a fun topic to sort of get from almost anybody because, as I was saying, you're going to have very, very different opinions from different people because some people are just despise the straight bowl and they'll tell you all about it when you ask them. So maybe it's a future topic we're going to have to keep bringing up with our, our future guests, uh, bendy or straight bowls. Um, I guess uh, another topic we uh, wanted to cover here on the show uh, looks like uh, the USA is having some expansions in their bowls uh, coming up here over the next uh, over the summer. They're doing a lot of tournaments. I've seen a lot of news bowls USA, different divisions there, uh, bringing out lots of tournaments this summer. So a certain tournament we wanted to uh, touch on to sort of just elaborate, promote for them um, was the Daryl had a a page open here for me to read central division uh, lawn bowling tournament july 15th to the 18th uh that one's in milwaukee so anybody who's either in the united states or anybody that's uh potentially wanting to go across the border there and play some bowls they're having a big tournament there uh july 15th the 18th there's cash prizes to a two-day event um so it looks like it's first prize for the pot liquor pairs it's a great name uh, is a thousand dollars and second prize is 500 and then looks like they have an open team event uh, and then they've got multiple flights multiple disciplines and you go with a four-person team so looks like that'd be a fun event to play with uh milwaukee's pretty far away from me so i definitely can't entertain going to that but good to see usa has got some events going and different uh tournaments starting up there all through the year now yeah, and I could see that being a pretty competitive event. I know just from uh, a few of the men and women I've met over the years from the United States that Milwaukee's one of the hotbeds of bulls in the United States. So I can imagine the competition would be pretty solid there. And uh, maybe some of those Californians and Floridians will be coming down for that. So there'll be a lot of people there. Uh, they usually show up in pretty strong amounts of people when they have big events. So that could be pretty exciting for sure. Yeah, no, I look forward to seeing what happens in those events. We'll we'll cover some of those results too, just because it's always the, the typical people you sort of see in the top there. So a lot of people on Team USA and former members of Team USA. So yeah, uh, cool to see that who wins those events and the pot liquor pairs. That's one of the best names I I've heard in a long time pretty incredible um if anybody out there listens to the show i mean they must because i just want to actually give them a shout out to the milwaukee park lawn bowls club is one of the first couple clubs that have actually asked us to give them a shout out uh, like we've said in the past if there's any clubs out there that want us to speak about them or have events they'd like us to promote we are more than happy to do that for you um but yeah it's pretty awesome that they have that going on so uh let us know how that works out for you guys what the results are like and uh, how it goes yeah, like, uh, I guess we can kind of move towards our last 
topic here. We got uh, our last, I guess our next video you'll probably be expecting from us is an After Dark show. Uh, got We got some good content planned for that. So as we've sort of hinted in the past, we're um, going to try and get a conversation going about North American Challenge and revamping that, sort of uh, getting some brainstorming sort of get some people talking about what they like dislike about the North American challenge so we've arranged for an after dark show coming up here in the next little while it's going to be a balance between American and Canadian players uh, people who do have experienced the North American challenge have been part of it before so we're excited to have that conversation sort of have both sides of the fence even have almost a com competing <laughs> viewpoints on what they like and what they don't like about the format so I, I think it'll be a great show coming up there to talk about that that tournament and what we can do it to maybe make, make it better absolutely and i think it's actually a pretty good time to be having a show with uh canadians and americans talking about something like that right on the i think we're having it i could be wrong but on the july long weekend so we got canada day in there and the fourth of july i know that's an i that's another big holiday down there so uh we might be able to get into talks about some of that stuff and some of the fun stuff that goes on around those so I think that's a pretty good time to be hosting that show. Um, I guess we could also talk about our next guest that's coming on to this podcast. We haven't had a guest in a while. Uh, I think you guys will be excited for this one. I don't know if Daryl wants me to completely leak the guest. I don't know if it's confirmed or not, but it's a, it, it is a uh, somebody who has a lot of experience uh, in the um, political side of bowls. Uh, should be able to clear up a lot of things around the whole COVID rules and whatever else is going on. Talk about some of the um, programs that Bulls Canada is running with uh, their club system thingy they have going on right now. I'm not too, too versed in that side of my realm of uh, information, but it should be fun. Um, she'll be a great guest if you haven't figured it out yet. I'm sure you'll find out soon. Um, I don't want to leak that because we like to surprise people. So that'll be fun. I'm pretty excited for that one. And Daryl will be returning to the Canadian Bowler podcast on the next episode. So welcome back, Daryl. And he can tell us about his little baby bowler, Ethan. So that'll be fun, too. Um, yeah, I don't. Um, this has been a shorter episode, I think. Mike, did you have anything else you wanted to talk about today? No, we've, we, we covered most of our topics there. And I feel like we kind of gave the information we wanted out so we're, we're excited for what what's coming up here in the next few weeks we we do have some stuff planned and sort of as we touch the coaching stuff so you're going to start seeing a little more topics uh videos out of us over the next little while we're gonna try and kind of keep the different different stuff coming out at different points keep things fresh so hopefully our new guests and our new conversations sort of stimulate some good conversation and some good some uh, good content for us Absolutely. Um, I guess with that being said, guys, we are going to wind it down for today. I know it's been a little shorter one. Uh, Daryl's got that rolling across the bottom. Make sure you follow, like, subscribe, share it with all your friends. We really do appreciate it. Uh, if you missed the show, like I said before, um, we're available on all major podcast platforms. This will be available on YouTube for your, to watch and share, um, all that good stuff. We'll see you next time, guys. Thanks again, Mike, for filling in for Daryl. Uh, and I guess until next time, guys, I hope all your bowls are touchers.